Hi, I'm Ted Swicky, plant pathologist, and this is the second of our two-part series on the nursery bench leachate method for detecting Phytophthora in nursery plants. So in part one of this two-part uh, presentation, we talked about how we developed this method for uh, testing nursery plants from by dating the leachate and optimize it to the degree possible. So the second part of this is how we optimize our detection test efficiency based on the way we sample in a nursery or sample batches within the nursery that we're interested in testing. As we have a diverse group of plants to test, we have to make decisions as to what we're going to include in the given test. And this then gets to the question of test sensitivity. What are we going to be able to detect? What's the limits of our detection ability? And knowing that, how it, do we best go about selecting plants to uh, optimize our ability to positively detect something when it in fact is there? So here's my partner, Elizabeth Bernhardt, irrigating one of our tests that we set up at UC Davis. These are tests involve setting up arrays that consisted of non-infected pots of plants. In this case, we used grasses, and they were all grown in pasteurized soil. And we included one, or in some cases more, uh, source plants of Phytophthora that we knew were infected. In this case, this is a tor. Here's a test array with, with smaller containers. And we see we have a single infested toyon surrounded by grass-filled cells. So we set out a number of these tests. They use different hosts and different sizes of containers. And we looked to see how often it was we detected Phytophthora based off the number of percentage of infected plants there were in the overall array. So that data is sort of summarized here. And we can look at the test array infection rate, the tears, we'll call it here. That's the percent of, of, of pots that are being irrigated that have have a Phytophthora source plant in them, and how many of the tests were successful. You can see we have different replications of these different levels. And we have these, a number of different success rates. You'll do see that this last set doesn't seem like it totally makes sense, where we have 100% infection in the array, but these are all single plant tests. The one thing we learned from doing single plant tests, such as this set here, we have all these D40s that are being individually baited five different uh, individually baited plants. And we find that Phytophthora is not consistently detected with the tests from the same plant done repeatedly. If we take a plant and test it one week and then the next week and the next week, we don't necessarily always get a positive result. Uh, here's an experiment that shows that with three different species of Phytophthora, a number of different host species, what you can see is we, we looked at four to five, nine to 10, and 15 days after these plants were artificially inoculated. And most of these did show Phytophthora within our, the first four to five days after infection. Then some of these same plants essentially were no detects later on, and then were detectable later on after that. Through these plants, like these here, Effectively, we're, we're no detect until this latest two week plus sampling. And so there's a number of possibilities for why these things happen. One, in the case of an inoculated plant, we have different latency periods between infection and sporulation on some of these plants. So some of these had a very short latent period. A few of them in this particular set of studies showed, showed longer latent periods. The other issue is the number of infected roots with sporangia that can release the low spores that we can detect is going to vary over time. That's going to be affected by how many live roots there are, uh, when those roots were infected, etc. The fact is that sporulation occurs most readily on recently infected roots. Once roots are dead and decaying due to secondary organisms, they're not going to produce a lot of sporangia. So, we took that data and then started looking at it in some other ways using statistical techniques to try to 
to come up with a probability function. How likely it would be that we would detect mitophthora with a, a given test, given the, a, a test array infection rate. And what we see here is our, our detection probability goes up to 1 or 100%. Once we get up to a test array infection rate of something like about 40%. So if we had 40% of the plants infected, we're almost certain that a single test is going to detect it. Um, once we drop down into this low range, though, we're not really hoping to see in a, in a DMT compliant nursery any kind of infection rate close to 40%. We want to really be able to detect down at this low end. And what we see is that it's more problematic at the low end. There's a, there's a steep curve here, but bottom line is we have to have pretty decent infection rates up to at least on the order of 10% to have a very high probability of detection. Well, there's still some other factors to take into account, and one of that is, is the size of the test array. So we can test plants from one up to some, some larger number of plants, and the, the size of the test array is going to affect the likelihood that we make a detection. And one of the reasons for that is that the the tear, the, the test array infection rate, differs based off of the array size. So say we have two infected plants to work with. In an array of 20, that constitutes 10%. That's a relatively high infection rate, and we're going to detect that most fairly commonly. If our array size is 40, our, our tear is only 5%. 5% of the plants are infected, and so our efficiency will drop off. It still should be detectable at some fairly good ratio. But if we push our ratio up, our array size up to 100, now we're down at 2%. That gets close to our, so far, the limit of our, our detection. So, and if we have even larger arrays, and we're still looking at the same couple of plants, uh, we're going to see a smaller and smaller um, fraction of of the times that we'd run this test that we're going to get a positive result. So the bottom line is that smaller test arrays generate a higher tear, and a higher tear gives us a higher, higher detection efficiency. So we can't we can do something about that. We can't necessarily affect this, this factor, which is the batch infection rate. We go out to some batch of plants there. If they're infected, they're going to have some kind of overall infection rate. Um, and if that infection rate is low, it's going to be hard to do much about that. Uh, if that infection rate is high, lots of different types of samples will be able to pick, pick that out. And if we have just sample at random and we take a lot of replicates, the test array infection rate will approximate the batch infection rate. Essentially, if we have 5% infected overall in this whole batch of plants here, say, if we took enough random samples, approximately on average we'd have 5% uh, infection rate across all of our samples, although there would be variation. But we can do a few things to change our odds a bit. We can increase our odds of detection if, instead of being random, we're selecting and we specifically try to select plants we think are more likely to be infected. This is what we call positive sampling bias. We're trying to positively sample plants that are, have a higher likelihood of being infected. And what that, has the, what that does is it increases the tear up above the batch infection rate. So we might only have 5% of the plants infected but if we selectively target that 5% and include them in our sample, suddenly we have a, a, a sample that has a much higher infection rate and a much higher probability that we can do a detection there. So we can look at plants that are, that are symptomatic, and that's one of the things we can look at. We can also look positionally. Say the plants aren't symptomatic, like this batch here, don't look particularly, nothing really stands out. But we do have some plants that are closer to this, this, this outside wall, or maybe there's a chance of splash contamination. So we might bias, in this case, 
to sample preferentially some of the plants that are close to that potential source of contamination. So um, these are some graphs that hopefully won't make your eyes spin, but let's look at what we're talking about here. So we're going to compare in these graphs what the advantages are of biased sampling in the blue lines over random or unbiased sampling, which are the red lines. And these green lines give us an indication of how much advantage, so basically the difference between the two lines. So if we have a large batch size, say we've got a thousand, thousand plants, and we can bias at different levels. A two to one bias means that we're twice as likely to pick out an infected plant than we would if we sampled at random. And a five to one, and a 10 to one similar. So a 10 to one would be a very strong bias. It means we're 10 times more likely to include a infected plant in the, the array than we would if we just simply grew them at random. And what we can see here is we have a great increase in, in efficiency that we're more likely to detect at low infection rates if we can bias our samples. And this occurs when we both have an array size of 20 range, or if we increase that array size to 40, we see the same effect. And there's not a huge difference to it, but in some respects, we can see there's just a, there's small differences between 20 and 40 here. And 40 for these large batch size gives us a slightly slightly better better advantage over a, a small array of size of 20. Now, if we drop the batch size from 1,000 down to 100, we see the same overall patterns. But um, what we see is that our advantages are most are greatest. That we're seeing the most advantage differential between these two lines um, with actually the smaller batch size, uh, or the array size. We use a array size of 20 compared to 40. See, these 40s don't show us as strong of an advantage. And one of the reasons is that if we're going to have 40 plants in the array and there's only 100 there overall, we're increasing the chance that we include infected, infected plants in, in the test, even if we're not biasing. So the smaller the, the, the array is, the more differential there is. Because if we have 100 plants and we have a 10% have a um, infection rate, there's only there's only one infected plant in there, right? So our odds of, of detecting that in out of 40 plants compared to out of 20 plants is going to be greater. We have, we have more chance that that one plant is going to be in our 40 array than in our 20 array. And if we can bias it, we suddenly push the line over this way. We're more likely to catch that in a smaller array where it could be identified more readily. Anyway, a little bit complicated, but the bottom line is that that array size varies with, with, with the situation, but 20 to 40 range is still acceptable. Okay, well, if we have a really large batch of plants, we can increase our confidence on the test by, by sampling multiple arrays. We can say, okay, well, we have a thousand plants here. We can test only 40. Or we can test multiple batches of 40, or we can test multiple batches of 20. So really, what is what's the most optimal way to do these these types of tests? And to get to this, we had to go to uh, Monte Carlo simulations. And Monte Carlo, what we're talking about is not this Monte Carlo, and certainly not these Monte Carlos. What we're talking about are statistical modeling techniques that involve sampling from from distributions and running simulations based off of those. So let's start again with our large batch size here. We have a thousand in that batch, and we have a low batch infection rate, only 1%. If we sample the bias here of one to one, which is no bias, um, if we have an array sizes running from 10 to 40, and we replicate them from one to four times, we can see that at our highest thing sampling intensity here, where we have four at 40, which is 160 plants at all, it's just better, slightly better than even odds of having a detection. Just, just 
56% probability that we would get a positive even though we have a 1% infection rate in there. If we bias at a simple bias of 2 to 1, that same number increases our odds up to 77% that we would get a detection. And if we increase our bias as high as 5 to 1, that 77% occurs at, at much less replication. We can actually get by with two arrays of 40. And in fact, um, that same number pops up again down here. If we have a very strong bias, essentially two arrays of 10 would be enough to pick it up at that, that same probability level. So you can see that there's some efficiency in using bias, of course, and then within a bias sample, there's efficiency of increasing the, the replication of arrays compared to increasing the size always. If we drop the batch, well, so this is a, at 1%. If we increase the infection rate, our, in general, our, these dark cells, our better infection rate detections, tend to increase. So this is 3%, if we go to 5%. We can see that we have a lot more latitude, even in an unbiased sample. By the time we get up to four sets at 40, we have something like a 96% likelihood of detection. However, with just a 2%, 2 to 1 bias, twice as likely to detect it. That 96 shows up way down here. We can, we can basically have to run three arrays at, at, of 20, only 60 bias compared to 160. Um, and have the same likelihood of detection. And even better if we're, we have a higher bias. Essentially, two tests of 10 theoretically could pick that up. OK, the only slightly counterintuitive thing that happens here is that if our batch size gets smaller, some of these dynamics change a bit. To begin with, the unbiased sample has a little bit of detection as we just get up into total numbers. Because our whole batch is 200, by the time we get up to 160 tested plants, our likelihood of detection at a, even a 1% infection rate is still better than 50%. It's 63. It's not huge, but it's not bad. We still see the advantage of bias, that we can get similar levels at 3 at 40 or or four at 20 uh, arrays, et cetera. As we increase the, the bias, we can see that our efficiency of these detections goes way up. But we also see a, kind of an odd thing starting to show up here. All the other graphs, this corner has always been the, the darkest color, which means the best efficiency. We see down in this case, we actually have a higher efficiency with four arrays of uh, 10 compared to four arrays of 40. And what this has to do is with is the depletion of the, the small number of infected plants by bias sampling. So if we're biasing at a 10 to 1 ratio, that means we're, we're picking out pretty efficiently which plants are likely to be infected. Well, if we include those in or small arrays, we now have a high tear. We have one out of 10, or we have two, two out of 10. And actually, that's as much as we can go with an infection rate of 1%. There are only two infected plants in the entire, in the entire array, of the whole entire batch of plants. So we can, if we force those into a small sample where the tear is, the tear is high, we're going to detect those at a greater efficiency than, say, we get one of those in a 1 in 40 um, ratio, then that's going to have a less of a detection deficiency than it does in here. So we get this little slightly counterintuitive thing, um, and it really does come down to this idea of bias. Uh, if we switch to higher infection rates, we see the same effect. This is a 3% infection rate. This is a 5% infection rate. Again, in a small array, random sampling is going to be fine up to a point if you do enough of it because you're sampling almost everything that's there. But if you can inject some bias into it, you can, you can maximize your detection efficiency with fewer samples. So here we maximize at 97%. With 96%, we can hit 
with basically 60 plants versus 160 again. Or we can actually get it with 40 plants if we're using these arrays of 10. So the idea is we really do want bias if we can, um, because we're much more likely to get a detection. So this whole concept relies on one or a few infected plants in an array. And so the last question is how likely is it that we're going to have that situation? Certainly when we put those infected plants into the array, we can develop that situation artificially. But suppose we do something like this. Here's a study in which we have a 4x5 array, 20 plants of 20, 20 toyon plants. Um, and there we have one of these that we artificially infect. We inoculate this one here, the second row in, right in the middle, uh, with Phytophthora cactorum. So we let that experiment run for, for a while, for 44 days. And by that point, we find that the inoculated plant is now dead. So we kind of terminated the experiment at that point and, and tested these surrounding plants in batches. And at least five of the 19 remaining plants, that's at least 26%, had been inf infected over that 44-day period. That's not a long time to have plants in the nursery. And you can see that going from one plant to which is which would be 1 out of 20, or 5%, um, up to at least 5, which is up to 26%, greatly increases your, your test rate, infection rate, even if you just randomly sample this whole batch. So here's just another example of that. We ran another test here. This is a 5 by 5 array, these TB2 type containers. And again, we inoculated, in this case, the center one. These are high leaf cherries, Prisdalisifolia. In this case, we came back quite a bit later. It was over the winter, and there, was, there wasn't actually necessarily irrigation going on all that time with our drain and whatnot. Well, this is what we saw at that point. Again, our inoculated plant was dead. And we can see that a number of these cells are also blank, so some plants have died in the, in the meantime. Here we individually baited each plant, um, and what we had in the same arrangement as shown there is this, that effectively all the plant, all the plants were had detectable infections with the exception of these three. This particular pair you don't see much on, but later after this picture was taken, the lesion developed on. So it's only these three pairs here that there are these three plants where we couldn't detect inoculum. If we go back to the what it looked like, we see that two of these are long dead plants, so there's not much material there. So it's not uncommon that when you've got material that's been dead for a long time that you don't always pick up much inoculum. And then there's this one live corner one, which maybe it's not infected, maybe it is, but the point is uh, it had low levels of inoculum either way. And the direction of irrigation in general would have been from the bottom towards 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 this side. And this would be, the aisle is on this side of the thing. So general splash direction would be towards the upper part of the frame, but still all these in this area were also infected as well as those on the sides. So that gives us an idea that you're going to have spread. So up to a point, you're not as often dealing with just one infected plant. You're dealing with clusters of infected plants. So how do we go about maximizing test sensitivity based on all the fancy statistics and these other kind of considerations? Well, first, we didn't really talk about this in the presentation, but try to observe the pretest guidelines for irrigation schedule and temperature to the best degree possible. Uh, if the conditions have been unfavorable for sporangia to form, there's not going to be very many sporangia out there, and you're going to have low detection efficiency. So we try not, we want to make sure things are regularly irrigated so they have a chance for sporangia to form. And we also want to avoid extreme temperatures, extremely cold or extremely hot temperatures, where it might, you might start reach the limits of what the particular Phytophthora species would actually function under. Then we want to 
generally run more tests with smaller numbers of plants rather than few tests or one test with many plants. So if you have 200 plants and you want to get a high, high efficiency testing, you're better off, rather than trying to test all 200 at once, to do two tests of 40 or three tests of 40 or three tests of 20 or 25 or whatever. Um, and again, part of that is based off of what we see in terms of symptoms. If we can't bias very much, the greater number is better. If we can clearly see ones that have more issues with them, we're better off testing them in smaller batches. Um, but in general, this limiting the range to 20 to 40 is generally preferable. Going down as few as 10 really only makes sense if you've got some clearly bad plants and you're really curious if those are those have some problems and you want to just set them aside and test them. There's no point in diluting them in a larger batch. So we're going to select tests that appear to be symptomatic, not random if at all possible, and there's a lot of symptoms we can look for there. Um, even if they don't show dieback or stunting or off color, you can just pick plants that look a little more funky or look a little smaller than average. Also, if we have dead plants in the array as we have here, it turns out that if the plant's completely dead, it's, the leachate test is usually not as effective as, as, as a soil, a root soil baiting method, because there's not likely to be a lot of sprains you're ready to go on that thing. So you're better off for tense sensitivity wise pulling that out of the array, testing it separately using this plant root, um, soil root uh, baiting method. Now, if the plants don't really seem to show symptoms, you can still try to bias, for, as we mentioned before, for something like risk factors. If we're looking at edges that might be close to potential sources of contamination, or edges against other batches that might look funny or that might have some kind of higher risk factors, those are the types of things that we can use to bias in that situation. Otherwise, you're left with random sampling. Um, the other thing we want to do is make sure there's plenty of root density there, because the more roots there are, the more chances we've got infected roots that have sprains on them that could be produced. So in general, we want well-rooted, dense roots. We don't really want to test plants at this stage here, where they've clearly just been transplanted or they're just coming up. There's not going to be much root density, and even if there is some infection there, the chances that we can detect it are going to be very low. So if we're going to upsize something, we want to test it before that upsize operation when its most roots are most dense compared to right after we transplanted it up. In general, we recommend you plant test plants from the same batch all at once in your array. There are some situations where if you're doing some kind of general survey stuff just to see if things are, are infected, you might want to mix plants from different tests but from different batches, but here we have a, an array that has a lot of different species in it, and if we get a positive result from this, we really don't know what that's associated with. Plus, you have some possibility of cross-contamination if one of these is infected, and this isn't. In that test, there could be enough chance of splash that you could actually infect some of these other ones. Within your own, within a single batch, that's not really a, a major concern, probably because you're going to end up dealing with that batch as a whole one way or another. If we have very large batches, then we want to cut it into smaller sub-batches and sample each of those um, based off of any kind of more uniform risk profiles. So some batches in this particular nursery were on actually on separate benches. So if they're in different benches and have different plants associated with their neighboring plants, there's slightly different risk factors associated with them. So we'd want to do sub-batches within each of these different groups that might have a slightly different risk profile. So if you want to get a better take on these statistics and understand how that one, uh, we have that also up on the website at this address. So that's the end of our presentation. Again, I'd like to thank those uh, organizations that supported this research and also thank our statistical consultant, Sean McClanahan, as well as, again, uh, the CDFA lab and the Rizzo lab.
for this support they provided for various aspects of these studies.